discussed them before, but not what they represent. See, when someone's actions or demeanors fall outside the normal behaviors of a group, it's assumed they belong to a different social class, possibly a completely different society. See, that's why sociologists are so restless. The more we find out, the more we need to find out. The belief that people belong to some group are the reasons why statistical anomalies fascinate and generate such interests. However, there is one clear exception to that rule in the common perception. The drifter. This person appears detached from everything surrounding him, having minimal engagement with the people in his life and moving from place to place on a regular basis. A shiftless soul harboring a grudge against society, some might say. What kind of treatment does this guy get? Hardly fair, but he was planning to move on eventually. A community recognizes the antisocial tendencies of the individual, then promptly excludes him from the activities normally associated with being a person. It's as though they know something's different, so they go out of their way to make these differences greater. Vicious cycle right there. These contrasts can become so great, even movies that star these pariahs get their own weird exclusion category. For instance, two films that are usually not thought of as in-depth review material are The Girl in Lover's Lane and First Blood. These movies have about as much in common as your average police lineup, with one being a late 50s exploitation piece best known for being made fun of. Big stupid. Big stupid? That's for stupid, can I have my wallet back now? And the other being the first film in the infamous Rambo series. The question you may be asking is why would I be compelled to compare and contrast these two seemingly unconnected movies? Even drifters have things in common if you ask the right questions. Let's begin the interrogation, first with the lesser known of the two. Meet Bix Dugan, a railroad bum. He's a traveling man with no plan, and that's the way he likes it. What he doesn't like is having a traveling companion, which comes in the form of Danny, the runaway. It's strange how the drifter has a constant sidekick in this film, and yet remains the quintessential loner. Even when he gives Danny a task, he expects the kid to fail in all ways until he can write the situation with his own unique style, sometimes sauntering into a brothel to retrieve the money he's about to be robbed of. He's a world-weary man whose wanderings never end, not even when there's a ripe opportunity right in front of him. No. Hey, why don't you put that dress on tonight? You and me will go for a walk. Maybe take in a movie. That's the best part about being the guy wandering through. You can say whatever you want. No consequences. And that's really what he wants to avoid. Bix knows that just transiting through a town will have no long-term effects on its inhabitants, nor its people have an effect on him. He's gliding through life on the power of non-existence, never tying down, not being around long enough to be noticed. Some people will actually take a liking to his damaged demeanor, because it's beyond comprehension. Interesting. He must be dark and brooding and deep. Sane people, on the other hand, Please, Pa, we're just going for a walk. Yes, I know. But after all, he's a stranger in town. What do you know about him? He's a drifter. He a one minute, gone the next. They're much more aware of the situation at hand. So, in Girl in Lover's Lane, we have a man with a forced connection to another wandering through town where certain authority figures do not approve of his presence. Pretty cut and dried. What ties could this have to First Blood? Well... Morning! Jump in. I'll make sure you're heading the right direction, huh? Portland, straight ahead. If you want some friendly advice, a haircut and take a bath. You wouldn't get hassled so much. Hope this ride helped you out. Surprisingly plentiful. A full dissection of its points could be a review on its own, but this movie surprisingly lacks in the sociology department. So, what we'll focus on is a breakdown of the character's interactions with the people around him. And as with any good breakdown, let's get the DM involved. Hey, you're preparing well for this. Ah! Don't stand up on a guy like that. Hey, sorry. Wow. Well, I guess you're ready to talk about the first Rambo movie, then. Oh. <laughs> Never seen it. This book's pretty good, though. Lucky coincidence, then. Tell me about it. John Rambo is a veteran who wanders through the wrong town. He's a decorated war hero that rubs the sheriff the wrong way simply by being a soldier who fought in the most recent conflict. Not a real war, like the lawman did. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Are you implying that Sheriff Teasel was a veteran, too? Dude, seriously? How did you not catch that? The movie kind of glances over that fact, or might have not mentioned it at all. Really? 
Hold on. Well, that certainly was not what I was expecting. Oh, hey, you're back. Yeah, what you staring at? Trying to find Servo. Actually, I found him an hour ago, but this poster's fascinating. You nitpick wall art when you're bored. I appreciate it. In detail. Tomato, tomato, I don't care what you call your issues. Anyway, First Blood the movie is a far cry from the novel. In fact, I'm amazed at how watered down the violence is compared to the source material. This is watered down. Yeah! Wow. Sosh, how many fatalities are there? Well, one. One. And looking at it, you could argue that was totally an accident. It's about, hmm, 14 less than the novel. Also, the hatred that the sheriff has towards Rambo in the film is really totally out of left field. I mean, did you know that in the novel, he didn't arrest John until repeated entries in the town? You know, with more than one warning not to return? I mean, it's still unreasonable, but, I mean, not as outlandish as the film's portrayal. About that, why did they drop the plot that the sheriff was military entirely? Technically, they didn't. I mean, there is this scene. So? See those medals in the background? Um... Oh, yeah! What are they? Purple Heart, Silver Star, Distinguished Service Cross. You have really good eyes. Thank you, they're my mother's. So he's also a decorated veteran. Why would he hate a fellow veteran? Tiso is more jealous that someone who was just in conflict received commendations higher than his own that he got in Korea. The Forgotten War, I will remind you. His personal bias against Rambo was what fuels his deputies to disrespect the Wandering Drifter, and thus, a plot is born. Alright, so in the book, John Rambo's not only much more persistent trying to get into the town, but the sheriff has a much more direct drive as to why he'd hate him in the first place. That really does change things. That, well, the ending is entirely different. How? Look at it this way. Had they gone with the book's ending? Rambo First Blood Part 2 would have been really hard to do. And completely forget about Rambo 3. Wow. Both of these films pull their punches in the home stretch and actually weaken their conclusion. Yeah, wait, wait! What other film? The Girl in Lover's Lane. You're trying to intellectualize Big Stupid. His name is Bix Dugan, and- Hold on, there's someone over by the pinball machine. I need to issue vague threats. Thanks for your support, DM. Really appreciate it. I only got a $50 bill! You know, I could break that for you. Oh, sure thing! Well, thanks, DM, you know, you're such a nice guy when you- Jump him! So, while the town's police may be biased against Rambo from the start, it does eventually come with good reason. You see, he doesn't react well to how they treat him when he's imprisoned, and eventually that leads to... Yeah, given his reaction to their abuse, it's unsurprising how this escalated. If he didn't lash out in such a violent way... No! No, 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 no! No! I will not! Watch you skip right over post-traumatic stress disorder. Good morning to you too, Psycho. How have you been? Do you really think you can talk about First Blood without consulting the only person on the show qualified to talk about this particular subject matter? Well, technically, I could have gone to Kelvin. He might be more qualified. <laughs> Are you going to let me talk, or am I going to have to force you to listen? You know, you don't have to take up time here to do that. We did give you your own show. Yes, I'm well aware. That's how I'm so knowledgeable about PTSD. Oh, come on. How bad could it be over there? They made me watch Cabin Boy. I, I'm... I'm sorry. I didn't know. Can I continue? Do you need a hug? Don't you dare! Post-traumatic stress disorder, a new term for an age-old condition known as shell shock, Heimweh, or exhausted heart, describes a series of symptoms that can follow an incident of heightened stress, such as combat, assault, or ukulele-related lawsuits. Often, these effects are long-lasting and life-altering. By any chance, would these symptoms include making loud noises, high levels of irritation... Don't step on my tail, this is my dog and pony show. Okay, then. Increased usage of non sequiturs. They present anywhere from months to years after the initial incident, and the intensity of each attack varies from person to person. Sometimes simply mentioning something associated with the act will do it. Other times, as in John Rambo's case, accidentally recreating the conditions will send the mind spiraling into itself. And once that happens, there's usually an episode where things get out of hand. You know, motorcycles stolen, dogs killed, the usual. 
Does this always happen with those suffering from PTSD? Oh no, sometimes it's quite the opposite. You see, manic reactions are only half of the equation. The other side of that coin is melancholia. Bix actually demonstrates the negative aspects of this condition beautifully. His strange relationship with his late abusive father turned his mind sour to connections with others. It's probably the reason he became a hobo in the first place. He found no want to relate with other people, defining his existence only by his most detrimental interactions with it. It sounds like both films owe their entire climax to a recognized mental disorder. Both protagonists react abnormally to stimulus surrounding them. Well, to quote Viktor Frankl, an abnormal response to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Very nice, Psycho. You should drop by more often. Not if there's any normal way to react to Jason Takes Manhattan or Magic Mike. Oh, speaking of that, are you going to review Magic Mike XXL? They actually made that sequel? Yeah, and it's already made back over four times its budget. It's a real breakout success. Huh, I wonder what's wrong with him. Our protagonists have similar mental states due to their past, the town attitudes are mirrored, and the outcomes of their reactions have similarly dark conclusions. The question I have, then, is why are both of these movies considered worth dismissal? Sure, the girl in Lover's Lane has serious technical flaws and is severely dated, and anyone claiming to love the Rambo movies is seen as being into gratuitous violence without point, but are both judgments unfair? When you get down to the core messages of both films, do they not say that every person is worth being treated like an equal, regardless of their damages or circumstances? Would each film not have turned into a much happier occasion if society, instead of estranging the outsider, viewed him instead as another member of the group? For really, what difference is there between people but experiences, genetics, and geography? These two films, while rife with their own baggage and problems, are perfect illustrations of how outsiders can outline our society's own flaws. After all, at the end of the day, these two are still cinema, and I've learned a lot from them. I'm the other socio, and I find teaching moments anywhere. However you choose to label you issues, <laughs> that's right, la label you issues. Label you issues. <laughs> Damn issues, why aren't you labeling? <laughs>